Good morning. We're pleased to have you with us for the Ethics Plenary on Mediator Ethics and Vulnerable Adult Abuse, Understanding Our Responsibilities. Our panel members this morning are the Honorable Michelle Morley. She is a circuit judge in the Fifth Judicial Circuit, and Judge Morley is a member of the Florida Judicial Qualifications Commission, serves on many court committees, and is co-chair of the Florida Family and Conciliation Courts Elder Caring Coordination Initiative. Our next panelist is Elizabeth Alachi with Adult Protective Services, the Florida Department of Children and Families. Elizabeth has been with Adult Protective Services since 2011, and she has experience being in the field as an adult protective investigator, a supervisor, and her current position as a senior human research services program specialist. Our next panelist is Juan Collins. He is the Dispute Resolution Center senior attorney, and Juan is a certified county mediator who previously worked at the Department of Children and Families as an attorney. Elizabeth is going to begin the session by sharing some information about what she does, providing us with some definitions, and assisting us in understanding the reporting process. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you, Susan. At Adult Protective Services, we serve the most vulnerable adults in the state of Florida. Our hotline is housed in Tallahassee, Florida, where the hotline is open 24 seven, seven days a week, even on weekends, holidays, there's always someone there to answer your call. So what I wanna talk about first are the vulnerable adults that we serve. They have to meet a certain criteria in order for us to have jurisdiction to investigate concerns of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and even self-neglect. So on the screen here, on the slide, you will see this is our definition of a vulnerable adult. It's basically in summary saying that it's somebody that's 18 or older and they have some type of disability that impairs them to complete their activities of daily living. They're impaired to care for themselves or even protect themselves. And so what does this look like? Or maybe you know some vulnerable adults. This could be someone with a mental illness that cannot manage their medications. They cannot protect themselves. They may have a history of Baker Acts. They would be considered a vulnerable adult no matter their age, as long as they're 18 and up. It could be somebody with dementia or, or Alzheimer's where their ability to make decisions is impaired, where they need someone else to make decisions for them. They get confused, they wander, they can't cook anymore. This also includes people with physical limitations such as quadriplegics, paraplegics, stroke victims, anyone that's wheelchair bound, bed bound, and it has to be a long-term disability. So it would not count for someone who broke their foot temporarily that will recover. That would be a short-term disability. And it automatically includes people with intellectual disabilities such as autism, Down syndrome. Those clients, or we like to call them victims, they are automatically going to be deemed a vulnerable adult. So let's talk about abuse. What does it look like? In your handouts, everyone has the definition from Florida statutes of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. But let's see what abuse would look like. So if you come into contact with a vulnerable adult that has some unexplained marks and bruises, such as if it's a bruise that's on a fleshy part of your body, such as your legs, your stomach, your cheeks, or maybe two black eyes, you may have concerns how they receive that injury and you may ask them about it. But if their explanation doesn't seem to match their injury, there's a good suspicion it could be abuse related. Most people who fall or that knock into things, they're gonna hit the bony premises of their body, such as their knees, their elbows, and their shins. 
So, and if you fall, you, if you do hit your face, you're going to hit your nose first and you know, your forehead. It's not normal to get bruises on your neck or your ears. So you pay attention to those things. Look for pattern marks, such as burns, finger marks, looks like somebody grabbed them on their arm, or maybe they were hit with a belt. You would see a, a lateral mark and you would see the form of the object possibly. If somebody has an unexplained fracture, some people, mostly our clients that are in nursing homes, we will receive reports where they have a hip fracture or a spiral fracture, a leg fracture, and there is no explanation on how it happened. None of the workers know, they are not aware of how it happened. So that becomes suspicious in itself. And you would want to report that if there's not a good explanation, such as maybe they had a fall because, you know, accidents will happen. But when there's no explanation for a fracture or even a laceration, it does become concerning for abuse. If someone has an STD and you know they're bed bound, incapacitated, and you know they're not sexually active, that would be cause for concern of sexual abuse. And let's not forget about Verbal abuse. Verbal abuse is also a form of abuse. Name calling, belittling, just intimidating somebody. That is also abuse. And this has, for us to have jurisdiction, this has to be caused by a caregiver, a household member, a family member. Possible indicators of neglect. Now, neglect has to be caused by a caregiver in order for Department of Children and Families to have jurisdiction. So if you see somebody and they have dirty clothing on, or maybe they're wearing the same outfit every time you see them, that could be an indicator that their caregiver is not providing adequate clothing for them. And it is the caregiver's job to meet all their needs. If it's winter time, and they don't have appropriate warm clothing on, such as a sweatshirt or a jacket, that is a form of neglect because they should be making sure they have the appropriate clothing for the time of the year. Does that person have a body odor? Maybe every time you see them, they always have a body odor about them. And that could be indicative of them not being bathed by their caregiver. Maybe not often, maybe not at all. It does happen. But sometimes be careful because that person may be refusing to take a bath. So make sure you try to find out that information too, to see if it's neglect on the caregiver or if the person's refusing. And the caregiver's other responsibilities are making sure that person's medical needs is being taken care of. If they're not receiving medication, if they're not going to their doctor's appointments, if they're not going to refer doctors such as a neurologist, if they're missing dialysis and that caregiver is not making sure that they have their medical needs met, that is medical neglect and it needs to be reported. We also like to look at people's home environments. Is it hazardous and dangerous to that person to where it's going to compromise their safety or their health, such as are there holes in the floor? Is there a hole in the roof where a tree may have fallen down and they didn't get the roof fixed? Is the electricity and water running? Is there food in the home? Is it a home that's very cluttered where you, can, you do not have clear pathways? Are there a lot of roaches and pests? The caregiver needs to provide a safe environment. So if you hear of someone that is living in a very dangerous environment, that would be a form of neglect. Isolation, that's where a caregiver may keep that person from talking to anyone they do not typically let the person see their family members, extended family members, friends. Sometimes they don't even let community providers come in to provide services. They will keep them isolated to themselves because they might be hiding something else other than neglecting them. They could be abusing them also. And then last but not least, are they not receiving their medications or having food in the home because the caregiver keeps saying that there's no money or I don't have enough money, but yet they're going out and buying new clothes for themselves and purses. So that segues into exploitation. But if the victim is not having their needs met due to someone taking all their money, it's going to be also considered neglect. So on exploitation, 
this has to be caused by someone that's in a position of trust, which is typically a family member or a caregiver. And the most common form of exploitation we see at DCF is someone just stealing their money and using it for something other than the victim's benefit. But other reasons or other ways to exploit someone is selling their assets and their property, such as their house selling and stealing their medications. Most people don't know about the medications. They think it's medical neglect. It is medical neglect because now they're not receiving those meds, but it's also exploiting them by stealing their medications and selling them. So when you have decided that you did meet a vulnerable adult and you do have some suspicions that they are being abused, neglected, exploited, or maybe even self-neglecting, you decide to make a report. And I wanna tell you about what you can expect when you talk to a hotline counselor. They're going to want to know the victim's name, the address or location, their date of birth or age and race and gender. And it's okay if you don't have all that information. At the very least, you at least need to have a means to locate. We do receive reports where it's unknown where the person's name and sometimes even their address will just get a cross street on the highway or a Burger King on the corner of a street because a person's homeless. Or even sometimes we only have a phone number to find the person because you might have drove by and noticed this vulnerable adult in need. And it's okay, the hotline will make the determination if they have enough information to take the report. And then they're going to ask you, how is that person a vulnerable adult? To the best of your knowledge, you want to tell them what known disabilities that you are aware that they have and how it impairs them. And then you want to list the concerns that you have of abuse, neglect, and exploitation, self-neglect, such as that you saw Mr. Smith today and he was wearing torn, dirty clothing. He had a strong body odor. He says he hasn't eaten in weeks and that his caregiver is not feeding him or maybe Mr. Smith has a bruise, a suspicious bruise on his arm, and he told you that he fell, but it just doesn't match the injury to the story. Those are just some examples. You wanna provide details, because it will really help the investigator complete their investigation, and address the concerns that you're reporting. And then also, when you're making a report against the caregiver or somebody else, if you know the relationship to the victim, the hotline will be asking you that information too. So please give them that. If you don't know it, it's okay. They will more than likely still take the report. So now you know what's expected of you. How do you make the report? Like I told you, the Florida Abuse Hotline accepts reports 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even on Christmas. Even myself, I have been out on a report on Christmas day. You have various ways to make the report. You can make it online or you can call the 1-800 number. The 1-800 number is the most popular and common way people make reports. Me, myself, I like to make the web report because I don't have to be kept on hold. And I can make sure my information gets reported correctly because I'm typing it up. We have Florida Relay services available and you can also fax your report if you like. People still do, mostly banks like to fax in reports. And also, if you suspect that that person is in imminent danger and needs immediate help, please call 911 first versus calling us because a law enforcement officer can get out there very quickly when our investigators, if the report is accepted, they have up to 24 hours sometimes to go respond. And we don't want something to happen to that vulnerable adult. And remember, your information is kept confidential everyone in Florida is mandated to report. And just so you can have a little insight in how busy we are in the state of Florida, these are the number of reports that we have received in the last fiscal year and on a daily basis. So in the 2019-2020 fiscal year, we received over 45,000 reports. And those are reports that were actively screened in and received and assigned to an investigator to go investigate. There were many more calls on top of that that were made to the hotline. They were just some don't meet criteria and they are screened out. That means that we do not accept them for various reasons. And so no one saw that person. And if you look at the table here, this is just a little snapshot of the week of July 5th through the 11th of this year. 
and it's broken down by region. I, for example, live in the central region, which consists of four judicial circuits. And the July 5th was a Sunday, and then the 11th is a Saturday. So as you can see the trend, it is much slower on the weekend than it is during the week. So the bulk of our cases are reported Monday through Friday, and that's when we are the busiest. And if you look at the bottom, you can see that it's the same trend when you add up all the regions throughout the state. So please remember that if you do suspect that somebody has been abused or neglected and they are a vulnerable adult, make a report to the hotline and we will go out and go ensure their safety. Juan is going to explain the obligations of mediators regarding vulnerable adults under the rules for certified and court appointed mediators, chapter 44, Florida statutes, and the Mediator Ethics Advisory Committee opinions. Thank you, Susan. I will be talking to you about mediation confidentiality, exceptions, and mediator obligations. Today, I want to share some information with you about how the legal authorities that govern mediator conduct relate to the topic of vulnerable adults. As mediators, you know that Florida Statute Section 44.405 the Mediator Confidentiality and Privilege Act states that all mediation communications shall be confidential. It is important to look at the definition of mediation communication, which is an oral or written statement or nonverbal conduct intended to make an assertion by or to a mediated participant made during the course of a mediation or prior to mediation if made in furtherance of mediation. Florida Statute 44405 further states that a mediation participant shall not disclose a mediation communication to a person other than another mediation participant or a participant's counsel. The statute does provide exceptions, and one of those exceptions applies to the topic of vulnerable adult abuse, neglect, and exploitation. I will also touch on child abuse because confidentiality exceptions and mandatory reporting requirements are basically the same. The exception to mediation confidentiality states that a mediator may make a mandatory report pursuant to chapter 39 or chapter 415 solely for the purpose of making the mandatory report to the entity requiring the report. In other words, while the mediator must make a report regarding vulnerable adult abuse, neglect, or ex exploitation, it can reveal the mediation communication to the essential central abuse hotline. The mediator can't discuss the mediation communication with a coworker, a supervisor, another mediator, or any non-participant in the mediation. The information learned during the mediation by the mediator, which would cause them to make a report, cannot be shared with anyone other than the abuse hotline. Chapter 39 states that any person who knows or has reasonable cause to suspect that a child is abused, abandoned, or neglected by a parent, legal, custody, legal custodian, caregiver, or other person responsible for the child's welfare, or that a child is in need of supervision and care and has no parent, legal guardian, or responsible adult relative immediately known or available to provide supervision, shall call such report to the Central Abuse Hotline. Chapter 415 requires a mandatory report for any person who knows or has reasonable cause to suspect that a vulnerable adult has been abused or is being abused, neglected, or exploited. And they should immediately report such knowledge or suspicion to the Central Abuse Hotline. Both statutes use the word shall. Therefore, the mediator is obligated to make reports under both Chapter 39 and Chapter 415. Mediators need to note there is an exception in Chapter 39, which states an officer or employee of the judicial branch is not required to again provide notice of reasonable cause to suspect child abuse, abandonment, or neglect when the child is currently being investigated by the department, there's an existing dependency case, or the matter has previously been reported to the department, provided that there's a reasonable cause to believe the information is already known to the department. 
this, this exception applies only when the information has been provided to the officer or employee of the court in the course of carrying out his or her official duties. So this is a very limited exception. There is no comparable exception when such information has previously been reported to the Central Abuse Hotline in Chapter 415 regarding the abuse, neglect, or exploitation of a vulnerable adult. This means that even if the mediator is told that the information regarding the vulnerable adult has previously been provided to the abuse hotline, the mediator still has an obligation to make a report. In Mediator Ethics Opinion 2011-018, the questioner asks, what is the ethical, ob ethical obligation to report child abuse, elder abuse, or abuse of the disabled? The MEAC opined that certified mediators are required to follow the statutory requirements for reporting abuse, neglect, abandonment, and exploitation in accordance with the Florida statutes and consistent with other professional licenses held by a certified mediator. Rule 10.520, Florida Rules for Certified and Court Appointed Mediators states that a mediator shall comply with all statutes, court rules, local court rules and administrative orders relevant to the practice of mediation. The MEAC opinion further states that the reporting of abuse of children, the elderly and vulnerable adults is not a violation of the statutory requirement for mediation confidentiality. Chapter 44 outlines there is no mediation confidentiality or communications that require a mandatory report pursuant to Chapter 39 or Chapter 415 solely for the purpose of making the report to the entity requiring the report. Although providing such information is required by statute, it may, prevent, it may present an ethical dilemma for the mediator who is obligated to be neutral and impartial. Some of the information presented in the mediation may go against the mediator's values or just might be outright offending, offending to the mediator. It wasn't a mediation, but I can remember as a military prosecutor, I was providing information in a child pornography case that was outright offensive to me and contrary to everything I stand for. But again, I was a prosecutor in an adversarial position. Rule 10.210 of the Florida Rules of Certifying the Court Mediator states that mediation is a process whereby a neutral and impartial third person acts to encourage and facilitate the resolution of a dispute without describing what it should be. Rule 10.330 states that a mediator should withdraw from mediation if the mediator is no longer impartial. So there may be times when a mediator is presented with information or sees something that puts them in a very difficult position or presents an ethical dilemma. Elizabeth talked about some of the indicators of neglect such as body odor, dirty clothing, or inappropriate clothing for the weather. She talked about indicators of physical abuse, such as unexplained marks or, and bruises, or unexplained lacerations. You might hear things about exploitation, in which a person knowingly, by deception or intimidation, obtain or uses, or endeavors to obtain or use, a vulnerable adult's funds, assets, or property with the intent to temporarily or permanently deprive a vulnerable adult of the use or benefit or possession of the funds and assets or property for the benefit of someone other than the vulnerable adult. Another form of exploitation the mediator must look, look out for is when a person who is assisting the vulnerable adult knows or should know that the vulnerable adult likes capacity to consent and obtains or uses and endeavors to obtain or use the vulnerable adults, funds, assets, or property. Also, as uh, Elizabeth said, verbal abuse, intimidation, or threatening behavior is a form of abuse. So the media should be prepared to deal with various indicators and types of abuse. In MEAC Opinion 2017-016, the MEAC was presented with the question, what if the Litigation is about nursing home abuse or neglect. The opinion states that if the mediator know that the mediation is going to be about abuse and neglect at a nursing home, before the mediation takes place, the, mediation, the mediator should call and inquire separately of the parties. 
if they had knowledge of the abuse, and if so, had they reported such abuse to the hotline? If the mediator cannot verify that one or both parties called the hotline, then the mediator should call the hotline and decline to do the mediation. The questioner also wants to know whether the mediator had to terminate the mediation if they made the report during the mediation. The MEAC opined that if a mediator decides during the mediation process to report a party's mediation communication to an appropriate body, the mediator may have to thereafter, may have to thereafter withdraw from the mediation to avoid the appearance of bias or partiality. The opinion states that if the mediator is the initial or first reporter to the central abuse hotline, that the mediator must adjourn or terminate the mediation. The opinion further states that in the event that the mediator is told by one or both of the parties that the abuse or neglect has been previously reported to the hotline, the mediator must still make a report to the hotline if the report is under Chapter 415 and also under Chapter 39, unless the mediator is a court employee reporting abuse as part of their official duties. The mediator should, the mediator should then continue to communicate with the parties that the mediator made a report to fulfill their obligations under the statute. If the mediator still believes that they can remain neutral and impartial despite making a report and knowledge of the facts underlying the report, the mediator, the MEAC believes that the appearance of bias or impartiality may not exist. And if the parties consent, the mediator may continue the mediation. Of course, if the mediator witnesses the actual abuse during the mediation session, the mediator is obligated to adjourn or terminate the mediation and make the appropriate report to the abuse hotline. Again, if, as uh, Elizabeth said, if there's something that you think that the vulnerable adult is in immediate danger, uh, you should, if you're in a courthouse, you should contact court security. And of course, if you're not, then you should call 911 to make sure that that uh, vulnerable adult is no longer uh, in, uh, in any kind of danger. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, I think that's really helpful information for mediators about what they should do under those legal authorities if um, they are confronted with signs of abuse, neglect, or exploitation of vulnerable adults uh, during the mediation, as well as the information about what to do if they learn of uh, an abuse report to the hotline before the mediation. And Elizabeth, the information you provided about what constitutes abuse, neglect, and exploitation, I think will be very helpful to mediators so that they can have uh, an awareness, alertness of what to look for in all types of mediation um, to detect signs of vulnerable adult abuse, neglect, or exploitation. So thank you both for that. Uh, the information is very helpful. Judge Morley, would you please share your perspective from the bench about these issues? Well, Susan, you gave me two tough acts to follow. Um, I think Elizabeth and Juan's presentations were wonderful. And I just want to uh, provide another illustration of a situation that a mediator might confront. So just if you would uh, let your mind wander off to the office where you do mediation and uh, imagine that you're mediating a case about a debt and you caucus with the older gentleman who is the defendant in the lawsuit and he tells you that he wishes he could pay the debt, uh, but he can't even stretch his income far enough to pay his light bill. He laughs and comments to you that he's gotten used to the cold showers, um, but that he uh, goes to bed when it gets too dark in the house and he eats okay, but he can't afford to pay for his medicine that the doctor prescribed for him. So with a heavy heart, you get his permission to share that with the plaintiff and you then go and caucus with the plaintiff and share all of that. Uh, and the plaintiff tells you that this man is just an eccentric, that he has plenty of money. He lives on uh, 70 acres, his house and his land are paid for. He could borrow against that uh, to pay this debt. He even has stock in a bank that's worth about $11 million that he could sell 
uh, and pay this debt. And uh, he knows that the man doesn't have any electric in the house. In fact, when he takes a shower, it's by a hose out by a barn. The neighbors have seen him do it. Uh, and that he walks to town once a week and buys a gallon of milk and all he ever eats is saltine crackers and milk. So what do you do with that? We heard Elizabeth say that um, you report cases where a, a family member or a caregiver is neglecting somebody, but this man is neglecting himself. You receive this information as part of a confidential uh, communication made during the course of mediation. What do you do with that information? You report it. You still need to call the abuse hotline and report it because this man is self-neglecting. The Department of Children and Family Services can investigate and perhaps provide the man with some services to make sure that he's living um, a protected and safe life. And whether he has the money or not, um, he might be removed from his home if he doesn't have the money to provide himself with the bare necessities of um, heat and uh, refrigeration and um, a better diet than what he's providing for himself. So I guess I should provide you with some statistics because when we talk about abusive homes, 80% of people are gonna talk about a child who's abused or interpersonal violence. But only 9% of people surveyed talk about an elderly person being abused. But it is prevalent and it does occur. And as mediators, we need to be Now, one of the things that concerns me from the bench is whether or not somebody had capacity to enter into an agreement during the course of mediation and to meaningfully participate in the mediation process. So I want you to all be very cognizant of whether or not your uh, aging participants in mediation are um, or have capacity. So understand that capacity can be influenced by two different things, cognitive skills as well as emotional um, circumstances. The cognitive skills we're familiar with, and I believe Elizabeth already talked about dementia and Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, but there are other um, influences in a person's life as they age that make a big difference in their uh, capacity to understand you know, consequences of the decisions that they're making. Remember that um, depression can lead to uh, dementia or forms of um, cognitive impairment in older folks. A urinary tract infection can have a, a monumental effect on their capacity. Um, malnutrition uh, can also impact somebody's capacity to meaningfully participate because it infect, affects their cognitive skills. But those are treatable and it would be a temporary situation that um, once they, those things were treated would resolve. Uh, there are certainly other forms of dementia that would not resolve as uh, indicated Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and the diseases that we're more familiar with. You need to be assessing for that. You need to be um, talking to the, the parties to a mediation uh, in an informal way uh, so that you can get some information about their capacity. Uh, if they're not able to meaningfully participate in the mediation, you need to stop it and not uh, allow that person to enter into an agreement that they don't understand. Um, there is also, as I said, an emotional component to capacity and the effects of uh, emotional um, incapacity are going to occur not just in the mediation room or in the mediation session is probably a better way to say that, uh, because you might suspect that the opposing party is uh, exerting some kind of emotional pressure on the, the um, older person. And that might be true, but it also might be somebody who's not even present at the mediation, a third party who the older person is dependent upon or feels some allegiance to. That, that allegiance or that sense of need to protect that individual are gonna influence that uh, older person's decisions 
and that could be an unfair and unmeaningful uh, outcome for the older person. So um, how do you detect that kind of emotional influence? Um, it could be passive or it could be active. The older person might make, make disclosures that indicate to you that they are being uh, coerced or they're under duress uh, from a caregiver. Typically, the older person who is dependent on a caregiver or a person who is um, exerting coercion or duress on them is going to protect them because uh, they don't want that relationship to be lost and they don't want to lose the um, benefits that the relationship has been providing for them, even though those benefits might belong to that older person. Uh, for example, if someone else is the Social Security payee on the older person's account and controls that benefit, receives that check and decides how it's going to be spent, that older person is going to uh, want to protect that individual to make sure that their needs are being met with their money. Um, Aging people have so many vulnerabilities. They uh, will depend on others for transportation, to schedule appointments for them, to explain instructions that they're given, uh, perhaps by a, a mental, I'm sorry, by a medical uh, provider or a dental provider, or even by uh, the electric company uh, in understanding their bill or knowing how to uh, fix a simple problem that might be occurring in their home, like putting a circuit breaker back on that might have been thrown. They might need somebody else to explain that to them. And they depend on that person and they will protect that person if that person is the abusive person in their life. Um, if how, how would you assess people? Well, I've already mentioned some things. When you start to hear um, that somebody else is controlling their money, uh, that somebody else is providing their transportation, understand that that transportation not only enables them to have access to medical care, but also enables them to have med uh, access to their friends, to other members of their family. Um, we know that older people become very attached to their pets, and it might be somebody who provides transportation to take that beloved pet to the vet um, or to church. Understand also that the more that this older person is out and about seeing family members and friends and going to church, the more opportunity there would be to observe whether abuse is going on in their home. And so the person who uh, the older person is dependent upon might be restricting that contact for just that reason so that the abuse or exploitation or even neglect is not being discovered. Um, in the mediation process, you might be able to peel back some of those layers um, directly, as I said, by some informal conversation with the older person or indirectly by hearing what's going on in their lives. Um, look for indications that they're being forced to write bad checks or that they have no access to their own bank account or that they don't even have a bank account. As I said, if somebody else is the payee on their retirement benefits, that person would be the one to hold the bank account. Uh, if they appear to be malnourished, we heard Elizabeth and Juan both talk about injuries that uh, might be explained, but the explanation doesn't match the injury. Um, if you hear that the injury is the result of clumsiness, uh, if the older person takes the blame for an injury that more than likely was caused by a third person, again, they're protecting somebody who they are dependent upon um, and who might be abusing them. Uh, when it comes to money, they might say that money that has been taken by uh, the perpetrator was really just a gift. Or in their culture, everybody shares everything they have. Or that they'll pay back money that was taken from them. They're covering, they're protecting and they're excusing the behavior because they rely on that person. We hear about that very often in interpersonal violence situations, but it probably happens more often with older persons who are so vulnerable and dependent. We also know that as people age, they become more dependent. Younger people become more independent and uh, less likely to need people that are abusive to them, but older people become more dependent. 
So be sensitive to those issues. Um, the most common victims are over 80. They are women most often, and they are women of color. Um, understand that somebody who has just lost a loved one or um, is living in a home without adequate facilities is not going to be exercising the best judgment. Uh, they might not be incapacitated uh, and they could participate in mediation. That's a judgment call that you need to make, but be sensitive to those issues. Certainly somebody who um, lost a loved one in the very recent past, last month or two or even six months, really shouldn't be making major decisions. Those are things that I worry about um, from the bench. Um, I hope that this information is helpful to you. I um, do worry about people who uh, are in the uh, winter of their life being taken advantage of. Um, I believe that mediators have an ethical obligation to um, identify uh, when those kinds of things are occurring and to report them. Whether you stop the mediation uh, because of the uh, perceived incapacity is again a decision that you're going to have to make on a case-by-case -case basis. But in each and every case, I would urge you to make a report. Let the Department of Children and Family Services do an investigation. It's out of your hands then. Um, but when it comes to allowing somebody to continue to participate in mediation, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, depending upon what you assess and what you hear. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everybody else. Thank you, Judge. Um, I appreciate all the information you gave us. I was just curious, have you ever made a report to the abuse hotline? I have made several reports to the abuse hotline. Yes, ma'am. And do you have any any wisdom about making a report that you want to share? Uh, well, certainly the um, DCF website um, will provide you with the information that uh, will be needed when you make the report. It would be helpful uh, for both you and the operator. Uh, that you look at that page before you either make the call or fax the information to them. It's not a lot of information, um, but it, and it's not uh, difficult information, but it, you are going to find some questions that you're unable to answer. For example, where is this person going to be in the next 24 hours? You might not know that. Um, but if you read it in advance, uh, maybe when you get home from um, your webinar today, um, you'll know what to ask the older person to, so that you're prepared to make the report. Um, the operator will indicate to you whether or not they accept the report. And if they accept the report, they'll give you their identification name and number. Um, they only use first names, but they'll give you their identification number. Uh, and they will ask you if you want a follow-up call. And uh, you may or may not want to know what happens. Um, that's up to you again. If the uh, operator determines that the case or the allegations are not rising to the level of the need for an investigation, they will let you know that too. Uh, but there still might be contact with the older person to see if the department can assist them in any way with services. Thank you. And did you have any particular points that you wanted to emphasize to our audience as takeaways from today's session? I would absolutely love it if you all were in that 9% of people that think of older abuse or uh, elder abuse when you're asked uh, to, to what occurs to you when you hear about uh, an abusive home and to be sensitive um, to the needs and the um, vulnerabilities of older people. Um, there is something called ageism because we treat older people differently than we do younger people. Um, Unfortunately, they are often treated as um, uh, an imposition rather than um, somebody who has worked hard and uh, paid their dues and um, had a maybe a difficult life or maybe an easy life and now things are challenging and they're having a hard time making a transition. So please be patient uh, and be in that 9% that um, is sensitive and looking for um, ways to help these older people if they are being abused, exploited, or neglected. Thank you. Thank you. And 
Elizabeth, do you have some particular takeaways that you'd like the audience to have from today's session? Yes, definitely. So I just want to remind everyone that when you make a report, your information is kept confidential. It will be shared with the investigator that is assigned to the report. And if you do leave a callback number, they are required to call you, preferably before they go out to see the victim that was named. Also remember that everyone in Florida is mandated. Even if you just hear about it, witness it, you need to make the report. And like I tell many of clients that have contacted me throughout my job history with DCF, when they talk about a scenario and they're not sure if they should make a report and based on what they're telling me, I always say, if you're on the fence about it, better to make the report than not make the report. Let the hotline be the one to determine if it constitutes a report. And if they do take it, let the investigator go out because it's better to be safe than sorry. So the mediator doesn't have to be an expert to uh, determine whether abuse, neglect, or exploitation has taken place. They could just see some signs and it would be all right if they called that in? Yes, definitely. That's actually a majority of our reports. We get a lot of reports that are from firsthand witnesses and we get a lot of reports that are people that just heard about it. And I have been an API myself and I have been on the front line and I will say, majority of our reports usually there isn't enough evidence to verify all of them but i have received reports that i have investigated that came from where second party kind of circumstantial information and it has been true so it was a good thing they made that report so yes they don't have to be an expert most of the people who make our reports are typically not experts and they're just hearing about what's happening and they make it. And sometimes it is happening. And it is a good thing that we get involved because not only do we do investigations, we also make referrals to other agency for service needs for those vulnerable adults. Because a lot of our vulnerable population, they just need some help in the home, so especially our self-neglect clients. So we're there to help besides interrogate people. <laughs> Thank you. And Juan, do you have any uh, particular points that you would like mediators to take from this session? Yes, I have several takeaways. And, and, and I like what Judge Moore to say. I encourage mediators to be part of that 9%. And, you know, sometimes, like you say, if you make that report, even if it's not proven and there is something going on, it puts those people, those abusers on notice and it may change their behavior and, and save somebody's life. So I think it's very important uh, to make the report. Now, I believe every mediator should know their obligations under the statutes, the rules, and the media advisory opinions on the subject matter. As a mediator, you should know and understand Florida Statute 44.405, the Mediation Confidentiality and Privilege Act, with regards to the confidentiality of mediation communications and the exceptions. Uh, you should be aware of your obligations under Chapter 39 and Chapter 415. Be familiar with the MEAC opinions that distinguish between the mediator's obligations as an initial reporter versus being a secondary reporter who is doing so to fulfill their statutory obligation. Finally, as a mediator, if you observe the con that continuing a mediation would result in unreasonable emotional cost to a party, or if the physical safety of any person is endangered by the continuation of the mediation, or the mediation entails fraud, duress, the absence of bargain ability, or unconscionable ability, you as a mediator should adjourn or terminate the mediation in accordance with rule 10.420. And finally, rule 10.330 requires a mediator to withdraw from the mediation if the mediator is no longer impartial. Thank you. So one, um, I can think of a couple of different possible scenarios where as a mediator, I might notice signs of abuse, neglect or exploitation. Um, and I'm just wondering how, when, when you were conducting mediations, did you ever make an abuse hotline call? Uh, not as a mediator. No, I've, I've never, I've never made one. 
And uh, so one scenario I'm thinking of would be um, you could have a mediation in which uh, the vulnerable adult is coming to a dissolution of marriage mediation um, with the other uh, spouse. And maybe that vulnerable adult is in a wheelchair and has some kind of medical condition. And so let's say it's the wife. And the wife asks if her father can come be in the mediation with her to help her. Um, and the husband doesn't have any objection to that. Um, no one objects to this extra participant. And you hear maybe in caucus or in joint session that father um, maybe saying something or some kind of body language that looks like he's pressuring his daughter to accept certain offers or make certain offers um, about property or um, anything that might be an issue in that dissolution of marriage, uh, that maybe her father is pressuring her and he's just a participant in the mediation. Do you think, uh, that if you thought there was some kind of um, abuse, verbal abuse, or um, maybe you noticed some kind of marks on her, or you thought she was being exploited in what the father was suggesting, like maybe the father has some interest in her property and makes, uh, makes a suggestion to her about an offer um, that you think is influenced by his interests, do you think those would be the kind of things that we're talking about today that might warrant an abuse hotline call? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it Not only would it uh, uh, probably require abuse hotline recall, uh, call, but you know, as mediators know, self-determination is the bedrock of mediation. If you can sense that a party is not making their own decisions, or there's an absence of bargainability, uh, that should sh certainly lead you toward adjourning or terminating the mediation at that time. And of course, if, if you see the conduct rises to the level of abuse, again, you should report it to the hotline. But again, like I said, to me, uh, self-determination is so important. And when you see that that's not occurring because of some influence from uh, in that case, the father, but like uh, Judge Morley said, sometimes it, you can sense it from a person who's not even physically at the mediation, but you get a sense of from the conversation and things that's going on that someone else may be influencing. At that time, I think as a mediator, you certainly have an obligation to terminate the mediation in accordance with the rules. But if you think it rises to the level of, uh, of abuse, neglect, or exploitation, it, you certainly should call the abuse hotline as well. So I, when I worked as a mediator for one of the judicial circuits uh, for eight years, I, uh, I conducted, I think, about 800 mediations. I think I only made one hotline call because I only saw um, some indicators, I think, in one mediation. So it didn't happen very frequently. But do you think you could see indicators of abuse uh, neglect and exploitation in any type of case you would mediate? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, Judge Morley gave her, uh, 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 her opinion about a case, in, you know, that dealt with uh, like small claims where, where a, um, a elder person owed a debt and, you know, probably had the ability to pay it. But you, you'll see it a, a lot in family law. And, um, and, and like you say, in any type of case, uh, and even in, uh, like I say, when a person, uh, an elderly person, one of their loved one dies, sometimes they come into a lot of money. And, you know, and if people don't have things together, you know, I'm, I was a military attorney and I always told people to have wills and power of attorneys, everything in place. Because you see, see it more and more each day when an elder person gets, uh, someone dies or someone gets sick, uh, the family kind of becomes chaotic and people start taking advantage of, of other people. Again, different dynamics come into play. Some people are 
are the people that the elder can depend on, but they might not be the most dependable person when it comes to finances and stuff. So a lot of times in any kind of situation, whether it's uh, dealing with the property or homes or, or, or finances, or like I say, or just, or just neglect of the person. Uh, so it can occur in any case and a mediator should be looking out for it in any type of case. I think that could include dependency mediations, right? Even circuit civil mediations. A absolutely, and, and, and when you ask Judge Morley, I remember being a dependency attorney for the Department of Children and Families, and very often I was just out of law school and, and I wasn't as quick to pick up on, on the cues of abuse as the judges were, but we would be in the middle of a, a dependency case and the judge was like, stop, you know, I need the attorneys to come up here. This was just said, which one of us is gonna call the hotline because somebody had to call the hotline. So I can certainly see you know, when Judge Morton said she called several times, you know, the judges would call us up to the bench. I was a DF, DCF attorney and you had the other attorneys, but you know, we heard this, it came out in the dependency, uh, uh, testimony and the case testimony and the judge like which one of us is going to call us in because somebody has to call it in so yes it, it happens all the time uh, just like in court you're going to hear the same type thing that are uh, accusations or, or facts that are presented you're going to see them in the mediation as well so the exception to confidentiality in chapter 44 for uh, a mandatory re abuse report on vulnerable adult issues. Um, does that open the door that the mediator could talk about that information, those co mediation communications um, outside of just reporting it? No, the statute says that uh, the exception applies only to the reporting agency. So that exception to that uh, mediation communication applies only to the hotline. Uh, you can't tell a, a co-worker, another mediator, you can't tell your supervisor. You can only tell the people on the hotline. Okay, um, because I know we, we do have handouts for this session and they are available on the website for the conference. And the mediators may find those very helpful. They've got the statutory provisions we've been talking about and the rules for certified court appointed mediators you've mentioned. And also the three MEAC opinions that you talked about, mediator uh, ethics advisory opinions. And um, I think it's uh, the MEAC 2011-018 that says that um, unless like Elizabeth said, it was a, an emergency where you wanted to call 911, um, the mediator doesn't have any other responsibility to call another agency. I, uh, I believe that MEAC opinion says, unless the mediator had that obligation from some other profession they happen to be a part of. So, right. so what I understand is the, um, the mediator wouldn't call law enforcement after reporting the, the suspicions to the hotline unless it was uh, a 911 call, which should be before the report to the hotline. Is that your understanding? Yes, yes, that's, that's, that's uh, absolutely right. You can only make it to the entity that requiring a report. That's what the statute says. And of course, the MEAC opinions uh, enforce that. And you know, you made a good point when you mentioned MEAC opinions, certainly for, for the mediators in the audience, if there's some scenario that doesn't fit in what we talked about, again, go to the MEAC. You can submit a MEAC question. If for some reason we didn't answer uh, some information that you have concerns about, you still got some, uh, your, your mind is clouded about some responsibility you have, again, you can submit a question to the MEAC and, and, and they will address, address those questions. And finally, Judge Morley, if you want to say anything else about capacity, you're welcome to do that. Thanks, Susan. Just the bottom line is that if uh, somebody who lacks capacity to enter into an agreement reaches agreement in a mediation and signs off on it, and then it is later raised as an issue to contest that agreement or to avoid that agreement, um, it's going to 
have wasted the time that was used to mediate it. It's going to waste the money that was spent on mediation. It's go going to cost the parties additional financial, ex I mean, emotional expense as well as financial expense. So understanding that somebody has capacity is essential um, to having a successful outcome for the parties. That is a very good point, uh, well taken. Uh, we should definitely keep that in mind. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. And we appreciate all of the panelists sharing their time and expertise with us today. As I mentioned, uh, these legal resources are available on our website and you now have a 30 minute break before your next workshop. Thank you.